You're listening to the Option Alpha Podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from OptionAlpha.com, working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered in iTunes and online because it's based on one thing and one thing only, and that's helping you make smarter trades. So thank you so much for tuning in again today. This is show number 25, and we've got an awesome guest that's going to be joining us for our interview, and that's John Carter, someone I definitely look up to and respect. He's been around a long time, and what you'll find during this interview is we go through so many different topics from his start and how he got started trading in 1998 and how he uses technical analysis, earnings trades, financing other trades, consistency, trade size, volatility. There's so much to learn in this interview. So make sure that you pay attention. It's going to be a little bit longer, but one key thing I want you to pay attention to as we kind of go through this interview with him is that what I really appreciate and admire about John is that he is very self-aware of what he's doing. So it's a really hard thing, not only in trading, but also just in business to be self-aware of what you're doing and be willing to make adjustments and changes along the way. And I think what you'll find as you listen to this interview is that his basic philosophy towards the market has been pretty much the same. But over that time period, he's made tweaks and changes along the way that have made him a smarter, more consistent, and better trader. And he's learned to deal with kind of situations and setbacks that, again, have led him to another level of success. Now, a couple times during the interview, just as a heads up, I did forget to unmute my mic. So there might be a little bit of a pause. We didn't end the interview, but I just forgot to unmute my mic. I didn't want to have an echo in the background. So it only lasts for a couple seconds uh, as we're going back and forth here. But it's a really great interview, and I hope you guys really, really enjoy it. So without further ado, let's get John on the call. All right, so we got John Carter on the phone. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Kurt, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Great. So I already introduced you in kind of the pre-call here, but why don't you tell everyone just a little bit about, you know, how you got started in trading? Because I think your story is a little bit different than most people who are professional traders that maybe have started at some sort of prop firm or, you know, worked for an investment bank and, you know, did all this Wall Street stuff. But you kind of took a different path to getting started in trading and futures and options. So can you kind of talk through how you got started? Sure, and and this is the kind of the short version. In in it would be it would have been cool, I guess, in retrospect, to maybe have gone like say the Wall Street route. But on the other hand, you kind of everybody kind of develops their own unique point of view, you know, based on their experience. And so my experience was is in high school, my father was and he still is a broker, and he just he and his buddies would be sitting around the table talking about stuff, and I just got interested in it that way. And I never wanted to be a broker. And I think that maybe was just because, hey, well, my gosh, my dad's a broker. That's not what I want to do. But man, the idea of trading really sounded cool. And so, you know, my senior year in high school and all through college and all through my kind of first four years of working in the corporate world, I was always actively trading. One of my favorite books during that time was Nicholas Darvis, How I Made $2 Million of the Stock Market. And I had started off trading options, you know, just doing the you know, just really no clue in terms of theta decay and all that. It was just, oh, I think this is going higher by a call. I think this is going to go lower by a put. And this was during the 90s. And, you know, that worked um, fairly well. I, you know, I had three boom and bust cycles until I got to a point where I could actually start, you know, start looking at consistency and stuff like that. And then once I got into consistency, then I actually was able to kind of quit. And I traded full time for, I think it was like four or five years before you know, at some point, I eventually started posting stuff online, mostly out of boredom, because after a while, you're just kind of like, okay, who do I talk to? But that's that's kind of my been my trading path. About your trading path, and this is why I wanted to have you on here, is that you didn't take that traditional approach, and and you are super successful at what you do and have been for a very long time. But it's so f- great to hear from people like you because you did have boom and bust, and you never started with where you are now, you know, your trading strategy wasn't perfect to begin with, it molded and evolved over time. So on that kind of topic, maybe you can talk through kind of how your strategy has evolved, because I know that you're a technician first, I mean, that's what you're really, really known for, but you have you always traded directionally with options or how has your strategy kind of evolved as you start, you know, adding options over the last couple of years? 
I, you know, it's it's a good it's a good question because I think it's an you know, and I I, I make an assumption that every trader kind of goes through a similar journey, not the exact same journey, but you know, for me, it was always looking at the reward first. So it's like, wow, you know, this stock, I think it's going to go this high, so I'm going to buy this call option. And at some point, and that and that does kind of tend to lead to kind of a boom and bust cycle. It's like, wow, you either make a lot of money or you just go through periods where you get these just really nasty drawdowns. And at some point, my mind kind of shifted, I guess, and, and I think it was more of an internal shift of, you know, what what do I want? I mean, what kind of experience do I want from trading? Do I want this, I can't sleep at night because I'm nervous or anxious and I'm not sure what's going to happen the next day. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to control myself because if I get really excited about something, you know, am I going to, what am I going to do versus um, why not? choose a trading style that's a little bit more consistent and takes advantage of all the things that options have to offer in terms of theta decay, um, but also allows you the opportunity to, particip partici to participate in a big move. You know, and one of the things that I think was always frustrating for me was, you know, I'd say like, okay, I'm going to sell a one standard deviation put credit spread. And then you see the stock make a two standard deviation move. Um, you know, it's great. You made money, but gosh, you know, had you bought calls on that one, you would have killed it. Your, you know, your calls would have went up five times. And so what I try to do like these days is balance out the idea of trying to combine, you know, the potential of catching a, ne a decent move, but making it as high probability as possible by bringing in other option strategies to kind of, I call it financing that move, you know, if it doesn't really pan out. I think that that's an interesting point because I know that, you know, people always will say, you know, well, you know, if we limit our upside potential, if we do a call spread or, you know, some sort of butterfly or iron condor, they really prohibit themselves from making that, you know, really big chunk of cash that they can make if they just bought a, you know, out of the money call. And that's, it's a really tough thing because on the outside, we know that that's, that's obviously the case. You're limiting your upside, but it's the consistency factor that you have to look for. So, when it comes to doing that, what are the types of things or the types of strategies that you really prefer uh, to trade with regard to making a more consistent high probability, but also maybe keeping you know some of that potential that you said by combining different strategies? Sure, and and you just and you you hit a good point there because one of the things that you know it's funny because the thing that I hear most from people what they want out of trading is consistency, but then when you look at how they're trading, they're trading in such a way as to promote inconsistency. And of course, buying calls if you think a stock's going to go higher, and buying puts if you think the stock's going to go lower is by definition in you know it's going to create inconsistency. So I mean I you know I think the best way to do consistency is like a debit spread, right? So, so how do you combine it? Well, I mean, a recent trade that we had done on Amazon, and so one of the things that I've found, and this is just a little nuance that I've found with stocks after earnings. And if a stock has like, say, a one and a half standard deviation move or higher after earnings, and this is just to the upside, I have not found it to be true to the downside, that it tends to keep going. And I think it's a combination of short covering and new buying. But what I've found in a situation like that is that that's a situation, for, so for example, say Amazon gaps up, it's trading at you know, $355, so, and the idea is like, all right, let's buy like say a $365 or a $370 call, it's $2, but we're going to assume from the outset that it's not going to work. So you know, it's like, okay, the odds of the stock going higher are high, we're going to assume that this position isn't going to work out, but so how do we finance this position? Okay, so then I would say maybe if I bought 10 of those calls, I might sell 15 of the at the money put credit spreads um, and, you know, potentially maybe 10 of one standard deviation put credit spreads. And all of a sudden, you know, you kind of sit there and you get a theta positive trade. So now the, you know, the how it could work out, and of course you got a position size so that if it all goes to hell in a handbasket that, you know, your max risk on the trade is acceptable. But generally what I found in that situation is that your, your put credit spreads in that situation will typically work out really well. It's like, oh, wow, well, that's, that's nice. What you don't know is if that stock has that extra oomph to you know, blow through some levels and really turn that out-of-the-money call into a three or four or a five-bagger. If it doesn't, usually you can actually set up a trade that has a slight profit. You know, the money that you make in the put spreads offsets the, you know, the money that you're losing in that out-of-money call. And then for the once in a while that it really does work, you've got a nice winner. And so that's kind of like one of the, I've done that more and more where if I see something that has potential, 
just making sure I'm really cognizant of, you know, of the fact of what's going on in the markets. Also knowing that the chances of that, you know, out of the money call doing something in your favor is low. Um, but also knowing it's like, wow, if this thing really gets going and, you know, the, the, the shorts lose control of the stock and get hammered, that could actually turn into a big winner. And so it's nice in terms of consistency is that, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those where you can actually add, a, if it doesn't work, you add a little bit of profit to your equity curve. And if it does work, it can turn into, I always call it like an EKG kind of a spike. And um, then you just move on to the next trade. Right. <clears throat> and I think it's, you know, that's a good point too. And I think you kind of, you know, covered a couple things I want to go back to here real quick too. But it's important that I think everyone who's listening obviously hears that, you know, one of the questions are, that I tell people to ask themselves all the time is how can I either reduce risk with the same position or replicate the same position with the money that I've received. So in your case, you're buying a call which is out of the money, but and that's, you know, by itself, just standalone, fairly risky because you don't know where it's going to go. It's got good potential to make money, but probability wise, it's not right there. And you're taking that position saying, okay, how can I reduce risk, the risk of that trade by selling a put spread below the market and helping finance that strategy. And that's such a key takeaway. And, and it's definitely something more advanced that people need to get, you know, get into, but that's a great example. And I think it could probably work for Netflix as well. Cause I know we traded Netflix around earnings. It didn't work out cause the stock made a huge, huge move. And, but we could have done something like that where we, you know, bought a call spread and sold a put spread to finance it. So uh, that was a key point too. Uh, one other thing you said too, and I just want to go back to it and maybe get your opinion on this, but I know that so many guys talk about position size. I've talked about it for a long time here about you know not having a too big of a position size so that you don't blow up your account. But what are your thoughts on position size about how big a position should be for a trader's account? And if you could, maybe you can talk about a smaller account versus a larger account because sometimes we have people that don't have a lot of funds to trade. So the question I always get is, well, if I don't have a lot of funds to trade, you know, I can't really make some of these positions because they take up too much just be, because they're higher capital requirement positions. Sure. And I, and I think that's really the, what it comes down to is from a trading perspective is either, you know, if you're, if you're a newer trader or, or, you know, you maybe you've been around a while, but you've got, you know, it just your access to capital is on the lower end. So maybe you have like a $5,000 account and, um, you, so, and I found that you're kind of in one of two camps. It's like you have like, okay, I've got a $5,000 account. And let's just call that a small account. Or you've got, say, something $100,000 or higher. We'll call that a, a larger account. And if you have a small account, you know, the, 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 the tough truth is that, yes, you know, you're going to be limited. You're not going to be able to do um, as many of the things like, hey, you know, selling at the money spreads and different things like that that, that actually have some good movement. And what I found with that is that there's essentially there's two goals. And if you've got a small account, your goal is essentially to turn it into a bigger account because then when you get a bigger account, you can actually create income off of it. So how do you how do you do both? Well, I'll start off with kind of big account first and consistency. With a big account and consistency, what happens is that your risk per trade actually I think is becomes critical. And if you are trading options. And let's say, and here's what, here's what I think an aggressive, modest goal is for options traders. Now, some people will hear this and go, that's way too aggressive. And other people will say, um, that's not aggressive enough. You know, it's going to be different for everybody. But I, I think that you can do, as a target, 2% per week with your option trades. And 2% per week, or I think it's 2.5% a week, right around that area. I mean, you're talking about 100% a year. And what happens with though with this though is that it's not so much the gains, it's the risk per trade. And if your goal is two percent a week, and that ends up being, and if it's compounded, it actually ends up being very very high. But what you're now managing on your trade is your risk and your net liquidating value. Um, you know the net lake, what the brokers call it. So in that kind of a situation, for example, right now I have about twenty percent of my account tied up in option trades. And that's about typical. I don't really need to go much more than that. Um, if I'm doing, like, say, a naked straddle or something, obviously that's going to take up more buying power. But there's this misnomer of, and believe me, this is all stuff I learned the hard way, where it's like, wow, this is a really good trade. I'm going to put, you know, half my trade, half my cash into this trade, and if it works out, it's going to be great. Oh yeah, we've all done that before. Yeah. <laughs> And well, the thing that's sad about that is that it can work great 19 out of 20 times. It's that 20th time that then takes you all the way back to zero. And that's what you want to you know, eliminate. 
Um, but if you have a small account, then it's a it is a little bit different. And you are so my opinion is if you've got like a five thousand dollar account, you're gonna have to do more, you know, just kind of buy a call or buy a put kind of a thing. And you're gonna have to be more careful about the instruments that you trade. You're like you you want to look at lower um, implied volatility things like ETFs, you know, like FXE. That's the euro. Buying a put on the euro, you're not gonna have a lot of theta decay. Uh, so there are, you know, there are different things like that that you can do with a smaller account to kind of help give you that boost. Uh, but that, you know, at the end of the day, you still want to. It's much, much better to slowly grow an account, like week after week, month after month, than try to get that home run tomorrow. The mentality of trying to get a home run tomorrow will guarantee you that this is just not going to work out for you. Key point is that you know, if you slowly grow your account, that's obviously better than losing 10% because you just don't need to gain another 10% to get back to par. You know what I mean? You got to do more than 10% to get back above. So, um, so that's interesting. So, and I think the key point there that you talked about is that out of all of the money that you have, you're only investing about 20% of your money. So the key there is that on that 20%, you're taking, you know, a little bit more risk and your return on capital for that 20% is much greater than a hundred percent or, you know, 2% a week. But it's that 20% as it's spread out over the account balance that really grows the whole portfolio. And so this is why, again, I love having guys like you on here because it just tells people that you don't have to take a $100,000 account and invest all $100,000 into trades every single week. It's not about that. It's about taking a smaller portion of your account and really targeting it on the strategies that, that make sense. So that was a, a great, great point. So if we could go back actually to, to one quick thing, because I know, again, like I said, you were a technician first. So how do you think or how do you still use technical analysis in your day-to-day -day strategy? Because I, we haven't had anybody on who does a lot of technicals like you do, but can maybe you can walk through kind of how you really use technical analysis to determine which direction or which strategy that you select. It's the uh, well, and one and one quick comment while you were talking. One of the things that I I, I like about having, you know, if you're only using say 20% of your capital, one of the questions that comes up is, well, what are you doing with the other 80%? And one of the things that I actually like to do as well is I'll do hedging. So if my portfolio is completely long, you know, 20% of my cash is tied up in all longs, I'll actually sit there with a, an order queued up, like say to buy like 40 puts on the queues. On if I get a sell signal in the queues, and then that way, you know, if you've got that one or two days of downside, you're essentially, you know, it's kind of like your your balance goes flat, and then you can take off your hedge, and then it's it's kind of a it's a little tricky, but that is one of the things I like to do, and the reason I like to have cash in the account. Right, and on that topic, because I say I'm glad you brought that up. So on that topic, because a lot of people ask all the time about delta neutral hedging. So will you hedge your entire portfolio, or will you hedge maybe say 10% of your account if you're getting too long? So, and this is and this is one of those things too, where it's it's you know it's a little bit of a it's, it's some of it's kind of instinct. But I will, if I'm looking at the internals and like the Nasdaq breaks a key support level and the ticks are going down, I'll get to the point where I'll you know either go delta neutral, where I try to hedge everything, or even a little extra. You know, it's kind of like where I go negative delta, and it's kind of like all right, as the market's going down, I'm making a little bit of money, but then of course you know fingers on the trigger to start taking that off. And it's one of those things that I found that at least in January, I did that twice. So there was one, I did that early in the month and held it for a couple of days and then took it off. And then uh, um, recently, I think it was last week, did it again. And it was just a day trade, but it was just kind of a way to kind of balance things out. Because really what's happening is you're managing your balance. And if you're, if you see that all of your positions are going against you and you can take an opposing position and your balance stays static. That's that's the goal with that type of a situation. Yeah, and I agree. And I think that it's definitely much more of an art than you know science as far as how you do it. But, but it's just interesting to hear kind of what your take is on, on how you do it. And I think the key is, is that you would you know, maybe scale into it and scale out of it, depending on, you know, how you, how you saw the charts moving. So, which is great. So, um, so yeah, so technical analysis though, how do you still use that as part of your day to day kind of operation and picking trades? Okay. So for technical analysis, what I've found and the longer I've done this, the more this has really hit home is that if you have to look at a chart for more than about half a second, you're looking at it too long. Uh, meaning that, you're trying to figure out is this thing going to go higher or lower you really it should be that fast and it, it, what i mean by that is that a, an obvious trend or an obvious setup is just that 
And as a was as a trader from a mindset, what happens that I found you got to be very, very careful about imposing your will on a stock. So, for example, if you're looking at CMG and you're thinking, God, you know, I just I love the stock. I saw that article in Yahoo Finance. I mean, everything looks great. And you start looking at a chart and, you know, eh, and you got to kind of, you know, start switching time frames and different things. And it's just just move on. And if because if in your mind you think something is good, you're going to find some way to make it good. It doesn't matter what it is. I mean, you know, if you've been buying a whale all the way down, it's because in the back of your mind, you know, it's like you're like, oh, this is a buy here. And, you know, it doesn't matter kind of what's going on on the chart. So I found is like and I always have this trick where. You know, I'll either have like one of my kids, if they're looking at the chart, say, do you think that's going up or down? Because to them, it's obvious. Or I'll stand at the back of a room and kind of see it. But it's literally, if you're looking at something, if, if you're taking more than half a second to make a decision, move on. Because it's not, it's muddled and you just want to go and look. Um, right. So that's that's the, the whole analysis paralysis thing. And it's funny that you have your kids do it. My daughter is only about 14 months, but I have my wife do it, which maybe might be the same thing because she knows nothing about finance and is perfect. an English teacher. So yeah, I have her look at it. I'm like, what do you think this is doing, honey? And she's like, I don't know. It's just going sideways to me. Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, because it's like it's it's easy to try to you know I think it's called like you know trying to squeeze blood from a turnip and it's you know if you're and if you look back and I'm I'm a big believer in keeping a, a trading journal and I do it visually where if I see a setup that I like I'm gonna take it I'll just get like a you know a screenshot and you know get a snapshot of the chart and if you do that and you start looking back at which trades were winners they're all pretty obvious I mean of course the next day you know you could get a downgrade or something like that but the ones that work typically work work out right away because they're pretty obvious right from the get-go. And um, and everybody's going to have a different style, whether you want to buy a pullback or, you know, buy you know buy a breakout or different things like that. But, you know, if you've got a chart that's trading sideways and you're buying calls, you're going to lose money. So your whole thing is that don't, don't be analysis paralysis, right? You can look at it a million different ways and eventually you might end up with the same conclusion or worse. Just look at the chart, make a decision, and then make a trade. So with regard to that, once you've made a decision, kind of, you know, moving past that point now, how do you select what strategy you're using? Because I know that from what research I've done on you, because I, I want to make sure that I'm always prepared for people who are on this podcast and I've watched a lot of your videos, you know, read a lot of your articles. So what research I found, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but kind of around 2011, 2012 or so, you really started looking at volatility with your option trades. So is that still a big part of how you select the strategies that you choose? That's you know, it is interesting, and over time, a different thing that a trader focuses on. But I would say that about yeah, 2011 or so, I did get a lot more honed in onto volatility, implied volatility, expected moves. It was something that I kind of paid attention to before, but was really more focused on the underlying. It's like okay, I think this is going to go higher, so. Um, you know, I will buy a call or I'm going to sell a put spread, but I really wasn't taking into account like the range of the implied volatility and stuff like that. And what I found is that the more you hone in on, um, it, it reminds me of kind of so like during the the recent Super Bowl, Seattle versus the, the 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 Patriots, the line on the game was designed to suck in as much Seahawk money as possible. And this happened the prior year where the line on the game against Denver in Seattle was, was designed to suck in as much money as, as possible on Denver. And it's kind of like, you know, the guys that are doing this kind of know which team is going to win, although I don't know how they could have known that well, the I was going to say, win. I yeah. was gonna say, I'm a Bronco fan, so that was horrible, and that was yeah. probably part of, part of my family's money that contributed to that line. See? Um, so when I, when I look at this, and I just kind of look at that with the market makers and how they're pricing the options, and they're taking into account things that we just don't know, and they're pricing those options to kind of take into that risk. And so once I started getting the hang of that and just making an assumption that you know the people that were pricing the options, you know the at-the-money call and the at-the-money put, are smart enough to know that if they sold both of these, that they've got a pretty good chance of making money on this trade. And that just kind of changed my way of thinking, going like, all right, so if I think this stock is going to go higher, I want to, I want to take a trade that also is going to take, take that into account. So that's why we're, I mean, essentially, if, you're going to, if you think a stock's going to go higher, you know, selling an at-the-money put credit spread is one of the best trades that you can do in terms of probabilities because 
Here, the stock could go higher or it could trade sideways and you're going to still make money on the trade and you're trading as on the same side as the people that are actually, you know, uh, creating the VIG, so to speak. And um, so that that's something I think it's really important to take into account. Right. And I think it's that, I mean, look, I think it's that whole, uh, you know, tasty trade mentality. And I know you've been on there before. I know those guys and, you know, the research that they've put out, no doubt. And I, I've talked to you about it a million times, you know, on our website, you know, before that is that. You know, that has brought a lot of context to how we make decisions nowadays because it used to be that we just, you know, sold options. We knew that it was a good decision to sell options, you know, during, you know, times when the market was moving down and, you know, the VIX was up, but we didn't really know why, like what, what was the real context behind it? So I think that that's a real key point is that, you know, that those market makers are pricing in that extra move that they're kind of buffering, you know, options on certain ends. So with regard to maybe we could change topics just a little bit um, to kind of, you know, round out our interview here. But with regard to earnings trades, there was um, a video that you did. And I don't remember where it was, but you had talked about when you make earnings trades because we're right in the middle of earnings season right now. When you make earnings trades, sometimes you'll skew them to one side. So I think you were doing a one standard deviation on the call side, but then you were doing a two standard deviation on the put side. So you're moving the put side out just a little bit further. Can you talk maybe just a little bit about why you did that or why you decide to do that on some trades versus others, just so we have a different idea of how you trade earnings versus maybe how somebody else does? Sure. And it is it is going to depend on the stock. So one of my favorite um, earning stocks is Starbucks. And the reason is, is that you can look at the price of coffee for the prior quarter and get a good idea of how their profits are. So like this last earnings report, coffee's been going down, down, down. And I don't know about you, but the last time I've been in Starbucks, they weren't offering me any discounts. So it was just kind of like one of those things, well, guess, I bet I bet their profits are gonna be higher. Right. And so on something like that, that's one of those where as an earnings play, I'm just gonna do bullish plays on it. Well, it's not that easy, you know, with every stock. So my what I have found is that earnings typically aren't drastic trend changers uh, for the most part. If a, you know, if a stock is trending higher and is near all-time highs, you know, like an Apple, you know, are earnings going to come out and destroy that stock? Most of the time, no. So if, it's, if the stock is uptrending, great. I will, you know, if I'm going to do like say an iron fly on it, I will do like maybe two standard. Well, you know, if maybe it's a two standard deviation call credit spread and a one standard deviation put credit spread. Although more and more now, I'm actually liking the idea of iron flies where, uh, you know, I'd, I'd done one on Netflix that didn't work, where I did, um, sold the, sold the at the money call and put, um, bought one standard deviation, you know, the expected move to the upside and the downside. The nice thing on that though, is what I found is with earnings is that if the stock does have a greater than expected move to the upside, you know, and blows through that strike that you sold, in the morning, you can just buy back the short side because typically the stock's going to keep on going, and it's kind of a nice, uh, nice way to do it. Where if it, you know, if it if it if it trades within its expected move, you know, like Facebook did, which was great, great, you get to keep all that premium. But if it blows through it to the upside, you can buy back the short side. You know, you want to make sure that, you know make sure that the risk that you have on the table. But typically, you'll be able to at least um, alleviate some of that, you know, that way or or selling at the money put spread. But I generally have found with earnings is that the you know a, a very obvious uptrend um, isn't going to fall apart. A very obvious downtrend you know isn't going to reverse. It's it's typically the earnings are going to be a continuation. And part of this is also realizing that the smart money out there, and I'm talking you know hey like the George Soroses and stuff like that that have got a, got an army of people digging this stuff. They already know that Apple earnings will be good. That's why they continue to buy it. Okay, and like they, you know, they, you know, there's people out there. They're checking the pipelines and different things like that. So you don't see, you know, earning surprises typically happen on sideways stocks because the stock price is showing us that there's uncertainty there. But otherwise, you know, I've found that the trends tend to continue. Was Mike was muted? But real quick question on this: it's because we've had a guy on who actually buys options heading into earnings. Is that something that you'll do also, or are you, with regard to trading earnings, you're doing it post earnings, looking for some sort of you know drop in implied volatility or you know decay in the options? How do you generally trade earnings? I I tend to do it more you know the day of earnings, sell some options, and then the day after actually do some option plays. That tends to be my favorite. I have found that. You know, if you go like three or four weeks out and you buy, like, say, a straddle before, 
Um, the best ones I've found that that works for is if the prior earnings had like a big move, like two standard deviations or more, because all that uncertainty and nervousness is now going to be priced in again. Uh, those actually tend to work out pretty good if you're buying options before. Um, otherwise, they can be a little, you know, a little flat. But the in general, like a, you know, to me, like the perfect play is, uh, you know, like for, um, you know, like Netflix is a good example. On that one, it's like, okay, it's an iron fly. It didn't work out. But the next morning, great. When it gaps up in the morning, I am looking for some consolidation for a couple of hours and then a continuation move to the upside. So I'm selling put credit spreads. You know, the premium on the options is fantastic. And um, potentially using some of those put credit spreads to finance some out of the money long calls. But really just keep it in mind that at this point, you know, a lot of people are, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of angst. Option prices are very, very high at those times, even though the implied volatility has already contracted. And it's a great time to sell. And I've found that whether it's a gap up or a gap down, selling puts is typically the way to go. If it gaps down, um, it usually like GILD this morning. It's you know it gapped down hard, and CMG this morning gapped down hard. But they typically find a, a bottom right away because you've got short covering that's taking profits. But on the upside, a gap up, you typically keep going higher because you've got new buyers and short covering. And so either way, after an earnings play, I've found that selling selling puts and put spreads is the way to go. Really interesting too, and I haven't you know I haven't actually honestly looked back and to see that, but it makes complete sense as to why you know on a gap down it would you know kind of consolidate and just run up a little bit with a little bit of short covering. So that's an interesting thing because we have traded this month a couple in um, in Microsoft and then also in Halliburton post earnings because we didn't see that implied volatility drop just yet, um, and those trades have been working out pretty good as well. So. Um, so let's go into the closing bell here for a second, and we'll talk about a trade that you're making right now. So if you could, uh, maybe go through kind of the thought process on a trade that you like right now, or something that you're interested in, that you're analyzing, and maybe help everyone out kind of start to finish on a new trade. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. Forward. Sure. There's a so a trade that I actually just put on about an hour before this interview, or before we you and I started talking, is I and on and I'm looking through the markets today and I don't see a lot of stuff to do. It's just like, okay, this is kind of a choppy mess. But I looked at uh, Biogen and I and I this is a stock that to me is it can be a little tricky to trade, but we've got you know this weekly massive move. And as we're talking right now, it's three. It's a three hundred ninety-one dollar stock. It's down a couple of bucks today, uh, but this weekly massive move. It's consolidating on the daily chart, and I'm getting buy signals on some intraday charts. You know, like the thirty-minute chart and the hourly chart. So what I'm looking here is that you know, yes, it's extended, but it's consolidating. And typically, you know, if you're extended and you're consolidating, I'm, I'm kind of looking for a little bit more upside here. So I am, the trade that I put on is I bought the 385 call, which is, let me get the deltas right here. And I did this uh, for options that expire next week. So okay. nine days out. And this, so this is for everyone who's listening. This is BIIB is the ticker symbol. And right about now at the time that we're actually doing this recording, stocks trading for about 391 and change. Correct. And so um, I did a call debit spread and I bought the, the 385 call. It's a Delta 65. And, and the bid ask on the stock is horrible. It's 1040 by 12. Of course, you know, you just do the midpoint on that. And then I sold the Delta 20. looks like the Delta, it's Delta 23 right now, which is the 405 call. And this is a, it's not a diagonal. It's a straight, it's a straight vertical. Both, both options expire. Um, they're the February two uh, options. So they expire uh, next week. And so I paid um, $8.28 for the spread. And the risk reward on this is, I will double check here, but yeah, it's a, so it's a $20 spread, bought it for $8.28. So risking, you know, essentially max risk there is gonna be $8.28 against a max profit of about $11.70. Uh, on something like this, typically I'm not looking for max profit. Uh, I'd be completely happy if it got up to about 80% a max and it's also one of those where I'm not looking for, you know, it's, I look at Biogen as not exploding higher from here, but kind of trickling its way towards the $400 strike price. And um, so that's all I'm looking for. So I, I think that the 405 call actually has a good chance of expiring worthless. 
could add a you know get a little bit of uh, extra on that 385 call and ultimately you know I'd be very happy to sell this thing for you know 13 to 15 dollars so, and the, the key is there is that you know just looking at the charts right now and I'll post a I'll post an image on the show notes for everyone who's listening of the chart kind of at the time that we did this recording so you guys can see what it looked like but yeah I mean it looks like it's just consolidating kind of popped after earnings a little bit and now it's and even just during the time that we've been talking, it's moved up another 60 cents or so. So it's been moving definitely in the direction that you want. So one thing that you said real quick here, and I wanted to touch on is that you'll close out the trade when it doesn't reach max, you know, you won't close out the trade or wait until it reaches max profit. So you'll close it out early. Is that typically what you do with a lot of your trades where you'll take on a trade, but then as soon as it starts to show some sort of profit, whatever percentage that is, you'll typically take off the risk and remove the trade. This, you know, and this is something that I've kind of evolved. I, um, you know, I had this, when I first started selling options, I used to have this and I, and I call it a, I, to me, it's a trading weakness that I have is that I love to let them expire worthless. And I think that's probably, you know, there's so many (laughs) things that are right. You know, when that happens, it's just like, it's just, yeah, so many things are right about that. Um, and I will, if, and if something's like, say, two standard deviations away, you know, I'm like, cool, let me let this expire worthless or at least buy back the short side for a nickel. But what I found now is that especially if I'm doing like an at the money spread or slightly in the money spread that, you know, 80 percent of max profit, I just literally will put in the order. Um, you know, I think we sold it was an Amazon put credit spread for a dollar seventy three placed in an order to buy it back for 36 cents, like right away, a good till cancel. And that's it. Now, now it's all of a sudden, because what happens is, and we've all been there where you've got something that's very close to max profit, and then it just blows up in your face. And if you start looking at that from a risk to reward ratio, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, you know, you're risking, you're trying to get that last six cents and, you know, you're risking five bucks, you know, to get it. And so, that's something I, I would call it a maturing on my part because I, I do get a savage glee from watching options that I've sold expire worthless. Um, but that's just in terms of consistency, that is what I try to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely of the camp too. When I started, it was just naked puts and calls. That's all I did when I started. And I love the idea of just letting everything go to expiration. It was like a payday at the end of the month. And but now it's you know a little bit better, and I think, and I don't know about you, but I think for me it definitely is, um, it's definitely a risk thing. It's you know how much am I really risking, but also how much time is left. You know if I've got 45 days left to go or 30 days left to go, and I've made the vast majority of the money I can make on these, it's not worth it for another 20 cents to let this thing go all the way to expiration. Yeah, it, I, I completely agree, and I, I kind of look at it too. And you know now you've got you, um, you know, and you've got a. Uh, a child now too is when I started having kids and I've got mine are nine, seven and five. And I kind of think like, how would I teach them? You know, if I wanted them to have a good life and it wouldn't be frustrating, you know, the trading perspective, what would I teach them? And I started realizing I'm going, I, you know, I don't mind. I I've got the, you know, the risk profile, I guess, where I don't mind selling a naked, you know, one standard or one and a half standard deviation straddle and dealing with it, you know, making adjustments and stuff like that. But like, would I want my kids to go through that? It's like, no. So how would I teach this to my kids? And it was interesting. And so I, as I started thinking about that, I just, you know, I, because I, I, to me in trading, there's so much potential right there in the market, markets in front of you and all the time. And I, and I don't really like overly conservative strategies. You know, I don't want to just sell, you know, two standard deviation iron condors and that's it. So how do you combine the idea of really generating kind of a really kind of, I guess, maximum profits, n- taking into account how the markets really work, but at the same time, you can sleep at night and you're, you know, you're trading in a way that kind of that causes a nice ebb and flow and risk control. And, you know, you never have to wake up to anything that's blowing up in your face because you've got, you know, everything in place. But at the same time, you've got the potential for some really nice gains. And so that's that's kind of how I try to look at structuring my portfolio these days. Great. So, all right. So kind of wrapping up here, maybe what I'd like to do is maybe ask your opinion for people who are out there. But if you would go back in time, so like, let's say we could rewind the clock, you start all over again. What are maybe the one or two things that you are doing now you wish you would have done when you started, you know, back in the, you know, early, late 90s? <laughs> Only one or two. <laughs> um, I don't know how long you want to stay on here if we go all day with this too. <laughs> um. So, okay, going back, if I could go back in time to my 1997 self, 
One of the things that I do fairly regularly now is I found that you know one of the best ways to to protect your profits from the market is to take them out. So I am a I'm a fairly regularly will siphon out uh, profits and just put them into you know other things like tangible assets. You know whether it's like hey some land or you know using that money to you know take the family on a trip or something like that. Um, back um, you know I guess you know back in the 90s or whatever it was always like it was always the goal was like, let's just make more and more money. And well, I think what would happen is you, at least for me, it would get distorted. And it's like, okay, now you got a hundred thousand, let's go for 200,000. Now you got 200,000, let's go for half a million. And then the numbers just started getting distorted. And when it gets distorted, you stop trading well, and, or at least I stopped trading well. And it's what I find is that when, by taking money out of the markets, you know, not only is it protecting it, from the markets, but it also takes away that kind of video game mentality that these aren't, you know, this isn't real. And it just makes you re- appreciate and respect, um, you know, that the, the money that's being created. And you don't want to look at it. It's interesting because when you're trading, the last thing you want to do is start equating it to like, oh my God, I just lost a teacher's salary on this trade. You don't want to do that. But at the same time, uh, you know, I, what I find is that it gives me uh, a respect for the markets. It gives me a kind of a foundation in terms of being able to structure my trades in such a way as to, you know, protect what I have. Because if you get into this gunslinging mode, you could make a lot of money really fast, but the 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 way that that turns out is guaranteed. <laughs> you know, it's just going to it's going to take a, a pretty nasty turn. And so I think that was, you know, that that would be one thing is just just wiring profits out and doing something with them. And then uh, from there, it's just it's just realizing. I, I remember a mentality of just really, really focused on. Boy, this is this this trade's going to be the big trade. This trade's going to be the big trade, versus just looking at the market with no expectation. You know, it's just kind of like, hey, you know what? I have I have no idea what the market's going to do here, but I'm going to place this trade. I'm not going to put all this pressure on myself to you know make enough money today so I can quit my job. It's getting really more than to a rhythm, and you're building a skill as a trader, and it becomes a lifetime skill as opposed to putting undue pressure on yourself and setting up you know expectations that you want the market to fulfill, and that just jacks up your whole mindset on a on a lot of different levels. But you know those are the two things that I would do. That's two different perspectives than we've we've definitely had other people say, and I know that. Um, it's funny that you said about taking money out. What me and my wife do is we take money out and, and put it into rental property because that's you know kind of my background is in REITs and so I know that business fairly well. And so I think it's right. I think you have to take you know some stuff out of the market just so you keep yourself a little bit sane and realize that it's it's actually real money at, at play and it's not just numbers on your brokerage account, you know. So uh, which is great. Yeah, and I love that. I, I think that's great doing it. I mean, I think I read something in the. Warren Buffett's last annual report, and he said that if he could, he would take his extra $20 billion and buy um, $20 billion worth of sing- single family homes for cash, you know, and that would be like his best, number one best investment. And I, you know, I love that idea of, you know, you take money out and putting it into like a rental property. And, you know, if you, if you make enough where you can just buy it for cash, great, or you just put a down payment, but it's, it's kind of taking like, you know, that money that you made in that Amazon debit spread and then suddenly it's in a home and now it's an asset that if something happens, it's still there. And it's, I, yeah, it's just, that's a great idea. Is that, and it's funny because if I lose a teacher salary, that would be my wife's salary. So she would be ticked if I lose on her <laughs> trade and lose, lose her teacher salary. But our thing is, and this is just a personal thing for us, is that if we're generating, you know, income trading, and we take that money out, we want to be generating some income on something. And so that's what we do is we do investment property. But whatever anybody does, whether they do that or pay off debt or, you know, pay down the balance on their mortgage, whatever it is, I think I think it's a, a really key point. So, well, hey, John, listen, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. If people want to find out more about you, I know that we talked that you have simpleroptions.com, but where can they find you? Where are you active? Where's the best place to get in touch with you? That's uh, that's generally the best place. I mean, that's where I'm essentially doing some daily commentary. Um, you can you know find out you know we have free videos on there. You can just kind of just see the different things I'm interested in. I mean, my primary, I mean, I trade a kind of all different markets, but that's my primary passion is the options market. So everyone can check that out again. It's in optionalpha.com slash show twenty five. Just the number twenty five. You can go to optionalpha.com slash show twenty five. See everything that we talked about here today with some charts and links and obviously information on John's website. So again, John, thank you so much 
for being on the show today, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Kirk. It was great. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, I truly hope you guys enjoyed today's show and got at least one thing out of it that you can apply right now to make you a smarter, more profitable trader and investor. And as always, you can get any additional resources, links that we mentioned in the show, related video training and charts by going to optionalpha.com slash show 25. That's just the number 25, optionalpha.com slash show 25. And hey, could you do me a favor? If you like this show and our interview today with John Carter, please head over to iTunes and give us a rating. It's honestly the best way to get this show into the hands of those who need it most, and I would be extremely grateful. Finally, you can get today's freebie for the podcast by going to optionalpha.com slash ebook, and we're giving away a copy of our ultimate strategy guide, which goes through our top 18 strategies in detail, not only what strategies we use, but how to enter them, how to price them, uh, what market situations they work best in. Again, you can grab that by going to optionalpha.com slash ebook. Until next time, happy trading.